Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DCL Learning Series. My name is Marianne Kalahana. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Data Conversion Laboratory, or DCL as we're also known. And today's presentation is titled S1000D, Ask the Experts, um, in which we invited you to submit any question you have related to the S1000D specification. And we have our two experts on staff to answer the questions. So we collected some questions um, during the registration process. And we also invite you to submit any additional questions that come to mind as we, as we discuss things today. Um, before we begin, I do want to let everyone know that this event is being recorded and it will be available in the on-demand section of our website at dataconversionlaboratory.com. So today I am really delighted to introduce my colleagues and today's speakers um, to you. We have Nave Greenberg and Chuck Davis. Nave is Director of US Defense Development for DCL. And he's a PMI certified project management professional with more than 20 years expertise in large scale complex conversions that use a number of DTDs and standards. He specializes in conversions for DCL's defense and tech doc business units and has been instrumental in developing DC, DCL's DITA, the Army 40051, S1000D, and 38784 conversion software suites. He also works with our clients to develop detailed um, project business rules. Neve is a member of the United States S1000D Management and Implementation Land Working Group. And he's been with DCL for more than 20 years. And he holds a BE in Mechanical Engineering from Stony Brook University. Welcome, Neve. Thank you. We also have Chuck Davis. Chuck is DCL's S1000D and AIDAM subject matter expert. Chuck also has more than 20 years of experience in aerospace, tech data, and tech data management for commercial and military clients. He wrote the S1000D aerospace business rules for the US Coast Guard and was on the integrated product team for the development of the S1000D business rules for the US Air Force. Chuck has developed both project rules and conversion strategies for multiple airframes converting to S1000D. He deeply understands the tactical approach to implementing S1000D, and then of course the strategic benefits that it brings to any organization. So welcome both of you, and before we begin, um, I thought let's just get everyone on the same starting page and let's give a brief overview on um, S1000D in terms of the business benefits. So Chuck, Nave, over to you. Okay. Um, so as far as the business benefits, uh, of course with S1000D, uh, it is a, um, you know, a international standard that uh, you know, allows you to put your content into uh, highly or put your data into a highly structured content, um, allowing for data reuse and um, uh, you know uh, being able to view that content in a uh, in a viewer uh, and allow for interactivity. Um, now, do you have anything you want to add on that aspect of it? Yeah, I mean, it is, uh, and I think maybe the next, uh, uh, the first question will cover a lot of what uh, we want to discuss, but it is a way to standardize your data, uh, whether it's, it's not necessarily in one industry, it's across uh, many industries uh, and, uh, you know, allow you to lower the, the sustainment cost and, uh, and uh, build repositories and, and filtering. Uh, but I think going to the first question would be, uh, yeah, so first question. Yes. So the first question is, uh, why is S1000D the 
ipso facto standard for the aerospace industry. So on that, uh, you know, S1000D, first of all, it is, it is not the ipso facto standard for the aerospace industry. However, it is widely used uh, throughout the aerospace industry and is um, definitely gaining traction. Um, <laughs> so, you know, with S1000D, one of the reasons for that and is, uh, you know, it is an international standard and it is, you know, the, 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 committee, the committee for S1000D handles the, the spec, the, the specification aspects of, as far as it goes. And so, you know, that in itself keeps large corporations or and especially um, small corporations from having to develop a standard and implement that and, um, you know, having to, to do that on their own. Uh, so that, of course, you know, is a, a big cost savings, um, you know, and the S1000D committee uh, provides the, uh, you know, the schemas and, and things of that nature as well. So, you know, it's it's definitely um, a benefit, you know, going going out across the, the industry. And I wanted to add that, uh, you know, in addition to being a, an XML standard and a, a non proprietor that anyone can use, not only the schemas uh, kind of forces you to, to standardize your, your data. S1000D uh, has the whole concept of business rules and, 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 and a breaks that actually further uh, restricts or standardize the data. So really, uh, it, it forces everyone to play uh, the same uh, or to map the same way and, and to handle data and, and that way also make data exchange a lot easier. Uh, and uh, because, you know, we keep hearing, you know, create once, use many, it, it, is a, it is a great way to lower the cost of sustainment, translation, uh, right. distribution, uh, you know, the whole concept of applicability is, is kind of, a, you know, a, a way to, to use the same data module, but to distribute it and, and use it to, to more than one uh, uh, customer. So it is a good way to standardize uh, your data because in the past you had standards that had schemas or DTDs, but it was still open to different interpretation of how to use yeah. uh, the data, how to tag the data. And that's what that is a little bit more robust in that way. And at the same time, because you have the project specific business rules, it also allows you to be more specific in specific uh, weapon system that does not apply to to other uh, system. You know, and I think it, it definitely, um, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, author once and, and, and use many times, you know, it's also with, um, you know, if, if with it spreading and gaining popularity, you also have the benefit of, um, you know, in the past, you would have a company that would produce something one way, and then the customer would, you know, they didn't use quite that format. And so, you know, having this implemented um, has definitely been a benefit. I've seen it already, you know, in several different uh, instances where, uh, you know, the customer is not having to figure out how to best utilize the data or convert it to their format, you know. Um, because you're already in a common um, common environment. Yes. So. Yeah, and also to you know, I mean, S one thousand is used across kind of uh, uh, industries, but it is uh, a good way for suppliers to submit the data the same uh, in, in in somewhat similar look and feel to uh, to an OEM or to a service that you know receives. Uh, data from many many suppliers and once that oem let's say develops or that uh, organization develops their own business rules and the all uh, uh ways to check the data it is a way to implement standardization across all the suppliers so you know that sort of it, it will lead to to other discussion in, in in later on in the webinar but it is a very powerful way to to attempt to standardize all the data that you receive yeah 
Okay. Yep. I think we're ready for the next question. What is the best way to convert my data to S one thousand D? So, you know, we 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 usually hear three kind of different ways uh, when we kind of interview the, the the client. It's always, or oh, either I'll manually hand tag the entire data set, or or I have a fully automated process to to convert the data. Or, or maybe I have a combination and I'll just clean it later. And, and, and it's not, it's really not that simple and clear cut. Uh, you know, find, first of all, finding the right balance between automation and, and, and manual process is, is really, really difficult. And it is, in many cases, kind of a case by case uh, uh, scenario. And it's not one solution fits all. And, in, and, and if we, especially going from legacy, to S1000, it's really truly like trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole. But uh, you know, there are ways to to approach uh, conversion to S1000D, and and I'm I'm really focusing on legacy conversion to S1000D because if you alter the data in S1000D, it's a little bit uh, uh, different. But uh, really, mm -hmm. with any kind of project, and some of the things that I'm going to cover is not only ties to s 1000 d but it plays a bigger role when you deal with standard that is very detailed oriented so yeah. you really need to plan your process you know you even need to plan how you're going to plan the process and uh you know and 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 that's not necessarily just you know developing the business rules and the project specific business rules and and it's mm -hmm. really analyzing the legacy data and Checking for anomalies, you know how tables are structured. Do graphics yeah. have text layers on it? Mm -hmm. And you know, Chuck and I actually, you know, we Chuck and I actually met on probably the first large-scale legacy conversion for 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 the Air Force at that yeah. time. Yes, it was. Twenty one thousand. Was... Let me emphasize. Right. That. And really, before there was even business rule uh, finalized for for that organization, and over there and Chuck can sort of chime in and, and 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 you know because he felt the pain more because we came more of a conversion house and he was more of a subject matter expert but you know analyzing our tables are structured and and if graphics have text layers or if there are references to pages you know what do you do when yeah. it's referred to page two and now page two is only a combination of 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 data modules and something with Chuck you know plays a, a huge role in, in 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 subject matter expertise is how do we break down the data? What if it doesn't have standard numbering system? What if it right. doesn't? Have data? And 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 I think Chuck can talk a little bit on on what kind of steps you can do when the data is not structured uh, uh, properly. Well, you know, it's when you when you have content like you said, it's a, when you have a legacy conversion. Uh, you know, you do have, you definitely have some hurdles that you have to, to deal with. And, uh, you know, it, it's in, you have to have, um, you know, you, like you said, you have to have a plan. And, uh, you know, when, when you're dealing with going in and uh, trying to, if, if you have to apply triple S in, you know, numbering to your content, or, you know, and, and definitely, if, you know, you're going through and, and applying info codes and things of that nature, and you have to make sure that it's done correctly. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not just a, um, it's, it's not a one size fits all. You know, you, you definitely have to go in and pay attention to your data. And, um, you know, not that you have to read it, you know, and, but you, you need to go in and, and, um, and you have to know where, you know, what your content is is talking about and so you know it's it's um it's good to to have someone in your corner that can um can help you achieve you know get your data and and get it into a spot where you can convert it correctly you have a uh a, 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 you know a, a road map in place and um you know and and move forward you know, like, like you were discussing. So, yeah. 
and 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 just uh, you know some things that maybe people don't think initially. I mean, it's very simple to say planning, but the planning, you know, the more you plan up front, really, the less you do later on. And oh yes, one thing that we actually did is is, is do is try to to do a, a content use analysis on the legacy data. You know, a lot of people think you know you do it later on when the data is tagged, but you know, there's multiple reasons why to do content news analysis up front besides the the, the, the obvious reason of, of dealing with less data and finding the redundancy. But it is a, a quick and easy way to give you clues as to where applicability can be used or where you can chunk the data. Uh, and and so, so really, you really do need to know the legacy data very well in order to have a, a, a good plan to go to S1000D. I think another critical point, which again, it's an obvious point, but for some reason it, people keep ignoring that, is really knowing and defining who all the stakeholders, but most importantly, who's going to be using the data. Right. Yeah. And I know that's part of uh, that's some of the things we we will discuss in one of the other questions. I think. Yeah. So uh, again, so defining the stakeholders is very critical. Uh, mm -hmm. Making sure that everybody is really on the same page and understand all the rules, because in S1000D, you know, you can have a rule and you can have 20 different interpretations depending on the people yeah. reading. Mm -hmm. so you do need the subject matter expertise really in all kind of level. And I think before we move to the next uh, question, there's like two or three more items. Is is uh, really go slowly at the beginning, do a proof of concept or do a conversion set or or, or maybe think about the approach of converting data sets first instead of just manuals. And yeah. you know, that's a kind of, a, when we talk about lesson learns, that's something that right. maybe we're gonna discuss later, but that touches the last point that I wanted to go is definitely lesson learn. Go over, if anybody previously did it, and I know that a lot of people don't like to share any kind of you know lesson learned mm -hmm. in the past, it's very difficult to find people that will be willing to, to share the finding but you know if it was done before successfully somewhere else or even unsuccessfully you know learning the bad oh yeah you, know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel correct yeah correct. next so what software or tools are necessary to convert ipb or ipd database data into s1000d data module for publishing to I eat them. So uh, again, the way I we, we read this question is really what's the approach or, or, or what uh, really uh, tools are needed to take uh, any kind of IP parts catalog data and convert it to S1000D. And it's really a factor of uh, what is the legacy that you're starting from? I mean, is it right. uh, you know, an old item? Is it uh, an Oracle database? Is it uh, already an HTML or XML? Is it PDF, Framemaker, Word? You know, the initial approach will be a little bit uh, different. I mean, we specifically sort of uh, develop our scripts and, 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 and throughout the year we sort of perfect the routines depending on, on, on project to project. So we're not, as Chuck said, reinventing the wheel for every project. Some components are reused uh, uh, from project to project. For example, how to handle tables or how to extract tables, it, it's done the same way. But uh, you know, in an IPD data, you do need to know where the data is reside. So if it's PDF, yeah. you need to know that column one is the index, part, column two is the part number. And it, but it could be different from, from project to project. So the software per se, in our case, it's software that we perfected. I don't believe there's kind of a, magic software kind of out of the box but uh that's the software that we use and tools specifically for the images we actually do have out of the box tools where out of the shelf tools where we had spot the graphics mm -hmm. but we do have a process that reads the hotspot and place the tagging in the xml uh and uh also we need to define and that's where the planning takes a critical role is where the metadata resides in the, in the legacy format. You know, a lot of time you have legacy format, right. it's not necessarily paper or PDF, it could be a database that holds all the data. Mm -hmm. um, and Chuck can even talk about a few uh, 
projects that we already did where we had that challenge of taking data. Well, you know, with when when you have data that is in a uh, you know in an old PDF or, or you know paper manuals things of that nature, um, you know you were talking you know metadata. Um, a lot of times that I, one thing I've seen a, a good bit anyway is that you know customers will say you know well uh, you know we want we want the metadata, you know, to give us this, you know, these, uh, or our data to give us these capabilities and, and you know, this this type of um, interactivity. And, you know, it's it's things that were not present at all because, you know, in, in those paper manuals, there is there is no real metadata, you know, per se. And so, um, you know, needing to define um, functionality, and um, you know, and then the you know business rules, I think is a big part of of like you know well, like you said before, is a big part of any conversion process. Uh, you know, and so, and also you know you need to be be careful to you know to, to or be careful of the situations where it it seems like there's a super quick easy fix on some you know or easy conversion. Because a lot of times it's um, if it sounds too good to be true, it it is, you know, um, and and not to discount some you know some things that that are um, that some capabilities that, that exist, uh, because there are some you know some some things that that we have done and others others as well, you know, that have made leaps and bounds in, in this area, you know, but it's um, it, it's not just a uh, press a button. You know, and I think one thing that Nave mentioned was, you know, it's, um, you know, you got to find the right balance between automation and and manual intervention in in these situations. So, yeah, and just to give an, an example, I mean, uh, you know, I mentioned before the whole concept of fixing later. You know, when you have 50 pages and and you spend five minutes a page, that's fine. I mean, I, it's still very difficult to be consistent in adding hotspot tagging or, or you know you can only imagine how time consuming but how difficult it is to be consistent in the way that you do uh the tagging and and another thing that i wanted to mention is you know if the legacy data is actually pdf award it's not you know sort of uh you know the benefit actually is that a lot more subject matter experts in the system know award and you know more than XML, yeah. so for them to manipulate the data or, or restructure the data, not necessarily create. But even if you have the client enhance the data before conversion to S one thousand D, it's a lot cheaper, a lot easier to do it with the legacy format like Word or stuff like that than anything else. So uh, there's always it's not necessarily the end of the world if your your legacy data is PDF. You know we did a lot of conversion right. PDF or Word, oh, yeah. whatever. So there is a kind of a balance uh, of, of, uh, of uh, you know, and that's why, you know, we, we, you know, the initial stage is very different between a PDF and an HTML or, or an Oracle database and, 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 and FrameMaker. It, the initial phase is different. The, 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 the goal is to get to a point in the process where it is similar uh, once you get to that point. And then you really don't reinvent the wheel every project and project. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I think we are ready for the next question. Mm -hmm. What are some lessons learned from data conversion? Yes. So yeah. we, we we did touch uh, touch on it a little bit in the previous uh, uh, questions. I think uh, uh, the more one of the most important thing is, is definitely plan ahead of time and plan your process and document and really. Oh, yeah. the, statement of the more you do up front the less you have to do later and the less costly that it's going to be is yes. definitely a true uh, a true statement and and do involve subject matter experts like chuck or even check subject matter experts on on not necessarily on the system itself on s1000d or any system of the legacy data any subject matter of the of the legacy data is very very critical and involve all of them up front 
you know, it's, it's, you know, you have to have all the stakeholders involved, you know, and, and the final users, um, you know, you can develop something and, and have a, a, an idea in your head, I guess, you know, that, uh, the way you want it to go. Um, but, you know, it, if it's not implemented in a way that the end user is not going to utilize uh, or it's cumbersome, uh, you know, they, they don't use it, you know, and, and that's, that's terrible, but that's, that's the reality of it. And, uh, you know, so that's, I think that's a big thing, you know, and, um, you know, you, it's good to definitely, you know, have their input, you know, how things will, um, how the item will flow and, uh, you know, your, your content will, will flow through the item. Um, and then, you know, make sure that they know that just, you know, it's, it's a, a matter of, um, you know, you're going to do everything you can as an organization or as a, 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 you know, for your, whatever you're working on to make it as usable as possible, you know, um, but th there are limitations as well, you know, um, whether it's the, uh, the structure or the, you know, the software or what, you know, there are limitations to things that can be done. So I think that's a big, a big thing to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Okay. Yeah. And we, we, we and, and we discussed the, the, the analyzing of the legacy data for, for, for we use for, for anomalies, mm -hmm. for what's missing and what's extra. With that yes. because it is kind of fitting uh it's really filling a, a square peg into a round hole but uh also you know discussing the whole you know everybody that discusses s1000 d knows okay business rules have to develop business rules have to develop you know, all that kind of stuff but i think what people are missing is everybody needs to be involved and and you need to do a walkthrough of the rules to make sure everybody on the same page and yes well, you know, one, one thing that in, in you know past uh, projects I've worked with is, you know, with with the business rules, like you said, you know, to make sure everyone's on the same page uh, in dealing with, uh, you know, the Coast Guard. One of the things that that we had to to work with, you know, um, one group would say, you know, we, we would discuss a, a rule, and so you know, one group would say, well, that's not necessary. We don't need that, you know, but the next one. The next group would say, you know, that's extremely important to what we're talking about, you know. And so having someone that, you know, uh, one of the big roles I played, at, at, you know, in that was, you know, trying to explain, I guess, the the nuances of how it would implement and, um, you know, what it actually meant to use this or not to use it. You know, think if you would lose functionality or lose metadata or what, you know, um, you know, but a lot of times it was people just did not understand exactly what you know what it was asking and so they would dismiss it or or you know they saw it as oh it's just a function we want as much as we can get you know which i understand that but um you know sometimes it can become more cumbersome trying to implement something than what it may be worth and so you know it's really just you know having some you know Make sure you take the time, and like you said, have everyone involved. Uh, you know that, that's going to be um, involved in the implementation of the of the item um, to make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah, and, and another item which may sound like a contradiction to what we always push for is the whole concept of automation. There is no push of a button solution to S one thousand D. Now, when we emphasize automation we really mean automation from one step to another step and from another step to another step. Uh, uh, just an example of, you know, when we're talking about legacy format, the extraction of text to a word format could be done both with automation and manual aspects, automated QA, you could do that, but you need to focus on that specific step that you're dealing right now. So, if you're dealing with text extraction, yes, you can use automation, you can develop automated QA tool, tools, but you do need the human intervention at some step, either before, after, maybe even during. You have to find that balance, which is so critical. Uh, you know, you're not going to spend uh, days and days of a, of a developer that might be more expensive if somebody can look at the data uh, 
uh, if it's only a few pages. But if you have a huge volume of data, you do need to focus more on automation. So yes. It is a very critical kind of balance between automation and manual review. Yeah. Yeah. And and again, uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Right. You know? I mean, some steps are similar from process to process. You may need to customize them. Yeah. Uh, from point to point. Which. Um, uh, uh, question five. Um, so, when is config and SDC uh, discodev, encodev, or handled via inline applicability? And where do you draw the line? Um, so, you know, of course, this is it's talking about applicability. Um, and Honestly, you know, really, when you're talking about um, about your applicability and 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 where do you draw the line, it's you want to get as much functionality out of your item as possible, of course. And so, you know, if if you can use uh, you know your attributes and, and these tags, and in, in order to separate your content. Uh, by tail, by you know your course conditions, and 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 you know all the different types of applicability. Um, however, uh, you know as far as where you draw the line, that's that's more that's going to be on a business case analysis, you know, like a case by case situation, really, um, depending upon you know how how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? You know how, how deep do you want um, how deep do you want this to go? How structured? Some companies um, and, and organizations will say, yes, we want S1000D. However, you know, it's we're very lenient on a lot of the rules and things of that nature. Uh, and then you have other organizations where, you know, it's it is extremely structured and, and you know, and so it's really in that kind of with this type of question, um, Honestly, I, th I think it's really just going to be a a case by case analysis. You know, you need to do a business case on what your what your what system you're working with, and then um, you know how how in depth and how structured do you require your content to be? Um, do you have anything? Yeah, no, I just think that this is a great example of how you know during the analysis phase and the and the, and the planning phase oh, that's yeah. the decision and and yeah. wouldn't be nice to sort of have a way to find first of all the the con you know you you, uh, you know if you had a way to do a content reuse on the data up front before you even do any conversion mm -hmm. and you see how much you can use how much is more redundant where do you have potential applicability Ooh. That's something that could help a lot to that decision. But if you have very few amount of pages or just few manuals mm -hmm. even there, you know, that's one way. But if you have a lot yeah. of data and you sustain it, you need to translate the data and you need to, that's when sort of uh, applicability plays a, a bigger well, role. And, and I remember um, you had mentioned a situation, um, you know, as far as, uh, and it wasn't, I don't know if it was applicability, it may have just been reused, and I apologize if it, if it wasn't applicability. Um, but in, in one of um, there was a situation you had told me about where there was like a 30 percent, um, you know, they found that they wouldn't have to um, convert 30 percent of their content uh, because of um, was it applicability or was it yeah, redundancy? No, it, was, it was actually uh, it was a combination. We had a, a, we, we still have a client that was going that initially did the process manually of training the redundant data, but using right. a use analysis they found out that 30 percent of the data can be reused one by one so it's safe to guess that okay your safety summary front matter yes okay right. everybody knows that that's an area that you're probably going to have some reuse you don't know how much we use and you don't know exactly where the reuse is but you can potentially go over there and 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 and, and do that and there is automated ways to find it but at the same time Finding those one-offs, so even if it's not duplicated, if it's a close match, if you have one more difference, and if you can see that picture, that's a huge time saving to know where applicability can be used. And that client oh, yeah. saves a lot of money. Then, yeah. Then. Okay. Next. Um, next question. Uh, can hotspots be enabled in procedure data modules? 
provided the data files are from an IPD data module. Okay, um, that's that's kind of an in-depth question. I mean, really, um, it, it, hotspots can work that way. Yes. Um, however, it it you, you could get into um, it could get into a really tricky situation with that. Um, you can have of course, multiple layers on a graphic. And so if you had a graphic that, you know, it was the same background picture in an IPV and you took that same background picture and you put a different layer, you remove the call outs, um, you know, from the IPV layer and you put a different layer on that graphic for say uh, removal and replacement of some you know it, it was the same picture but it would have different um you know step one step two step three like a procedural data module would then theoretically yes you could you could do that um you know and i, I do know of organizations that have had multiple um they, they, they've used the same graphic, you know, or the background layer of, of the graphic. And then if, instead of, uh, you know, having numbered call outs, would just have kind of um, like a, a lollipop call out, you know, and, and so, you know, that way you didn't have to re renumber a, a graphic. Um, but even in that, it's depending upon how deep your applicability concept goes, you know, that could really determine how much of this type of thing you would be able to accomplish in reusing, you know, your your graphics from your IPBs for procedural content. Um, have you guys seen any of this, Nelly, in, in anything in the past, really, um, much of this or? Not as much. I mean, the graphics again. If the hats, if the labels are the same, you can you reuse it. Obviously. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, layers of graphics. Not, not. No. I mean, it's something that will be touched on ongoing kind of uh, existing projects that we have. Now, right. But uh, not that. Um, no. Not that much. But again, as you said, I actually initially when I read this question, I dumped it up for people like me because I'm not at that level. <laughs> Is you, but I, I thought the question was if you use a graphic in IPD, if it has the same hotspot in procedural, then the answer is yes, you know. But if you do have text layers with applicability on the graphics, the answer is also probably yes. I just we didn't, it, it's it complicates the process a little bit more, um, right? It makes it a little bit more difficult, yeah. Okay, next. Is the logic engine something we could build in-house or is this uh, more specific to a specialized vendor resource? So again, I, if I read the question or understood the question properly, it, 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 the question is here, can anyone basically build uh, an engine that will convert, again, any kind of data to S1000D? Uh, and again, it depends on, 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 on also on the formats, but, uh, it's not a simple pro, uh, you know. It's not a simple uh, uh, process to create to create an, a, a, a conversion automation conversion script uh, to take data to S one thousand D. Otherwise, we won't be around for so many years. But what to, what's important to emphasize: migration to any kind of standard of, of XML, but migration to S one thousand D, and that's what people may mistaken you know, it's oversimplified uh, the conversion. It's it's not a conversion script. It's a conversion process to go to S1000D. That's yeah. a very, very, very critical thing to understand. Just because you have a script that, again, never happens that legacy data is always the same and you take that, you convert, goodbye, you convert. It's very highly customized. And that's where you have a multi-step where you and analyze the data. Uh, you, 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 you have the business rules. You have two-layer business rules. You yes. have uh, DMRL to create. So 
you know, you 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 bring you could bring up the 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 ish, the, the concept of the eighty twenty rules. You know, can you automate it to to a level that yes, you can, but uh, every case is is a case by case. And uh, you know, throughout the years, we developed scripts that can be reused. So even you know, like cross references or tagging tables or or creating the uh, data module. The concept is the same. A table is a table, but a table could be broken down into uh, a procedure. If you have one column that are the step, the next column is the, the uh, is the is the action itself. Uh, mm. But you know, cross reference. So we do have. We're not reinventing the wheel of of treating cross references, but you do need to customize the process of how do you uh, uh, recognize a cross reference. Does it say C Figure Two in next manual? C Figure Two in TO so-and-so, you know, uh, or just about figure 10 years ago, figure the 10 years ago, there's a lot of keywords and, 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 and patterns that, that makes it very, very uh, difficult to have, again, one solution that even gets you to the 80-20 rules. But uh, right. when we approach a, pro approach a project, we do need to customize it. And, and some of it is done by the business rules because they're different, but some of it because the legacy data is so different. Yeah. And, yeah. And I don't know, Chuck, if you want to add. Um, you know, it, it really, I think that, uh, you know, it would be safe to say, you know, that I think, you know, like you said, the 80-20 rule does not really apply to this, you know, and, um, you know, it, because it is something that, it could it could vary your your legacy content could vary so greatly and then also you know um you know what your your output what your desired output you know that you're looking for um you know it it really is something that when it comes to like you know, with a logic engine you know in, in conversion process um it's you know I feel like it's it's something that it, it you need to be very careful as far as um, when you if you start going into this type of situation, um, you know, knowing how you're going to go about it, you know, and, and you know having things set up in things rules in place, you know, like what you were saying is is very critical. Yeah. Um, so that's that's really all I would have on that. You know, just make sure it's you're very careful in how you're approaching the situation. Which did again to to the to the to the point that that's why planning is so critical. Oh, yeah, and finding yeah. those tools are, are, are very very critical because software and automation it's basically taking a rule that you developed after analyzing the data and automating it. So if if you can yeah. define it, you can automate it. But you do need to define it, and you do need, do need to understand that a hundred percent it's going to be different from project to project. Right. And let me assure you that it's probably also different between section to section in the same yeah, manual. It's, it'll be different within that project, you know. Right. Uh, you know, so it, like you said, it needs to be defined, but under, like you said, understand that even when you define it, it you will find anomalies throughout your, your data where that definition does not fit what you're trying to, to make it fit into, so. Yeah, and let me just give you know two quick examples. Something simple, something complex. Something as simple as a table that spans over pages. Mm -hmm. What happened in some table? It suddenly jumps from five columns to six columns. What if you have row merging that is not you know that it's sort of in between cells? Or right. maybe, and if you define it up front, it does a beautiful job. But what do you do with a table that's that that does span over multiple pages? or something a little bit more complex than a fault isolation. We all know what happens in the legacy data. You have like an arrow that tells you yes, no, and the yes goes to a different uh, page. You you need to define those rules and you may come to the conclusion in the analysis phase up front. You know what, this is a the best way, the best approach over here is to extract the data, put it in a format that we can automate, that put it in a table format or whatever. And then you can really actually check the the validity of the legacy data because I guarantee there's going to be a missing yes link or no link or it's going to link to a to to a to a uh, 
uh, question that doesn't have a branch. Right. It just it, one thing for sure is that legacy data is not consistent. But right. You, but you need to find the way of where that inconsistencies are and what do you do with those inconsistencies, which yeah. again brings to the point of planning. Right. Uh, next question. <clears throat> Uh, okay. Uh, is the process data module only triggered by fault identified by by a fault identified from feedback from a conditions-based monitoring system? Um, that's a great question, actually. Um, so, short answer is is no, it is not, uh, or it doesn't have to be anyway. Um, that is one way that you could trigger a, a you know a process data module. Um, however, you can go into a process data module uh, just on, you know, I'm going to change a tire, you know, something as simple, you know, um, are you changing the tire because, you know, it's, it's time um, or, it, you know, did you have a blowout? Did you have, you know, it could be, you know, any number of reasons. Um, what and I said, you know, tire, but there could be any number of reasons why you why you are performing said maintenance action, you know, and so, uh, you know, is it if it's a fault, then you know, yes, but you know, it could be, um, you know, if it was, well, I guess it was based over a time period that wouldn't be condition based monitoring, but, um, but and. It, it can be triggered from a, a fault isolation or a fault identified from feedback, um, but like I said, it, it can also be um, it could be any number of actions that could uh, could drive going into a process data module. Um, and, and one example that that we've dealt with recently, um, you know, we we were able to convert some content in order to to provide the uh, functionality that was desired, uh, you know, we were able to convert this some data to uh, to a process DM, and um, you know, it, it performed well. But you know, it, it's it um, it was very in depth uh, as far as how it how it flowed, um, and then you know that and that's one thing also to take into. Um, to account when you're dealing with process data module, um, and and this is, I guess, looking at it from a conversion aspect, um, you know, the, the process DM is is interesting, and people like the concept of it. But you know, if your data, if your legacy data is not structured to um, provide that flow that what you would normally, you know, that you would normally get out of a process DM, then you know you could wind up you know ha being in a much more costly environment you know because you may have to rewrite data rewrite content in order to allow it to flow that you know in the way that would um that you would gain a, you know or benefit from a process dm so um i guess you know it, it can be like i said it, it can be triggered by fault, but there's also you know, many other other ways that a, a, a process DM can be. Um, you can you can go into a process DM. Yeah, and I, I don't have much to add, but as Chuck said, you know, sometimes if, if the legacy format is actually an existing item, and they do want to mimic the way the text flows, then yes, we, it, it was a kind of a. a a difficult task but with a lot of planning we were able to automate the process to do it but uh, again it, it depends on the situation and and it depends on on really a case by case but uh, yeah yeah but that's we really saw it on a way that if, if, if text flows a little odd and doesn't follow and and because people are used to the legacy format but still want to go to s1000d uh, the process name does play uh, a role over there besides uh, yeah both. okay is it difficult to provide the same content to different customers that have different breaks so uh, that's also a 
very good question I, 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 that depends really on the BRICS. Uh, you know, how different the BRICS is, number one. Uh, you know, if, if there's some rules that contradict each other, then you need a separate, you know, I mean, because you do point to the BRICS. You do po point uh, uh, to the BRICS. So again, really, the short answer is uh, really depending on, on the BRICS, how, how different the BRICS are from one customer to another customer. That's yeah, I, th I think you could, if you, if you were, had one customer that, uh, you know, had more structure you know you could go maybe go backwards a little you know if, if one did not require as much but allowed more um you know you could take what was more structured and still deliver you know to one that was uh more lenient but go in the opposite direction i think you would have much more trouble there um and then also that could really you know you get into issues of you know different applicability and um and things of that nature it, like like Nave said you know it's it's doable but it could it could be extremely um and it, it could be an extremely in-depth process uh to do that and could wind up be more trouble than it's worth I, I wonder but I don't know it, like you said, it would depend on, it'd be a case-by-case -case analysis really on that. Yeah, and you do need to take into account, this, you know, uh, sustaining the data. How do you, uh, you know, yeah, what updates, uh, you know, and, yeah. and again, brings back to the point of, of planning upfront and, and knowing that variables before you make a decision, you know, it might be, no, keep separate, you know, separate that or even use the same data module uh, different data module which are very very similar but just because the bricks is different use it differently mm -hmm. but it is really unless we know specifically the, the case it is a case by case but it could get very very difficult or if you fully totally separate it it's not well like you said i mean to to produce it one time it might be doable but to sustain that data that in that same way uh could be extremely difficult. Yeah. So, okay. Next. Okay. Um, will there be a CIR with the capability to reuse acronyms in the near future? So, really, um, I don't know that I've heard of using a CIR for that. How, however, uh, you know there is the the ability to tag your acronyms um and you know and then you would reuse when you tag it as an acronym in the beginning you know and then you use that and you just call back to it uh as you you tag your content and um you know you it should be able to with s1000 you have the ability to just reuse that same acronym over and over again which is similar to I, I guess a CIR in a in a sense, but um, you know it's really just using the the tagging structure in the you know in the schemas that are provided, uh, you know definitely uh, allows for the use of of ac the use and reuse of acronyms throughout your content, um, and and really if you if you're able to run um, you know run software on your content for for data reuse uh you know that's something that you could easily be able to to pick up on and and know and then you know where to reuse that you know those acronym tags throughout your data yeah yeah uh, do you have anything extra? no i mean actually uh you know thinking back to to the previous question right. what if the business rule was one in one case use common information repositories and then the other one was do not that will complicate you know yeah. the, the using yeah. of breaks but uh yeah. you know you know that's really where you know that's why chuck is talking about this question and not myself <laughs> he will know that information but uh, no i don't have anything to add uh, on that so uh -huh. Mary Ann, I, I don't know unless some questions are uh, popped in which i 
going we do have some questions that come in and i can see right now that we're not going to get through all of them um <laughs> but but let's at least tackle at least tackle uh see how many we can hit um okay. So one question is, how widely is the process data model used in the industry? Um, this person is uh, looking to deploy, but they're struggling to understand how that logic engine is derived. So it, it's, yeah, I guess it, it would depend, you know, as far as how, how, how widespread it is. Um, I know it is used uh now how how far how far and wide it's used i'm not real sure um it's it the the issue that i've seen and now please jump in you know is is with the process data module um you know is the sustainment of that process data module is the biggest hurdle that i, I guess i've seen and you know you can have someone who can can program your 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 you know or, or write your data module to to provide you the content, but um, if you try to sustain that data in house without the the knowledge of uh, you know how to do that, it can be very in depth and and um, you know can definitely be a hurdle of you know out there for for um, for those that are trying to sustain your your data. Yeah, and and to add, if you if you were asked me that question a year ago, it would have been totally different, you know. Yes. I mean, I'm yeah. saying, wow, well, that's crazy, you know. But uh, it, again, it depends, you know, your legacy data. Number one, an example that we spoke about a, a project that we did was that the data was already in an item format, and we yes. needed to mimic that flow. Which the only way to do it is process DM. So, and that's a big uh, uh, usage. So. Uh, th th there are examples. I think people shy away from it because it's very complicated, and, and a lot of time they can accomplish that with different kind of tagging, fault isolation, or, or whatever, you know. But it's really, again, we keep coming back to it, the, the case by case. But that's every time you yeah, talk about two thousand D, yeah, you work case by case, you know. Yeah, it, it would definitely be something to you know to talk with them and find out, uh, you know, how they would going to be implementing. The, the process DM, um, and as Nave said, if there's uh, options available, you know, uh, other tagging options available to to um, still get functionality out of your data, um, you know, that, that may be a better fit for that, that business model. Okay, so speaking of uh, the business model, business choices, this is going to be a really challenging one to answer. Um, so I'm just going to have to cut you guys off in a minute. S1000D and DITA, we know that there are similarities, okay. but what are the different? What are some of the differences? And basically, why would a company prefer S1000D over DITA? Yeah, no, I, I mean. Ooh. I, <laughs> I mean, I always, I always categorize, you know, people that are familiar with DITA and, and S1000, they always say S1000D is DITA on steroids. I always, you know, that's basically, you know, uh, DITA is really dealing with three kind of about the it's changing, but, you know, you have a concept, you have tasks, you have reference, you have topics, you can highly customize it, but, uh, but if you need to understand and categorize your data, more in detail like okay understand that this is a fault understand that this is a procedural understand that this is descriptive s1000 d is really the only way to go uh but it's really again because of the show time i would say s1000 is truly beat on steroids a lot more uh options to uh to filter your data use applicability use process a lot more content driven but data on that and has a lot of out-of-the-box kind of uh, uh, solution. But again, it's 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 really what kind of data do you have? Right, right. And 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 I would invite um, you know when questions like that come up, please use DCL as a resource. You can 
always email info at dclab.com. And um, I will personally facilitate that question to one of our, um, of course, we have Nave and Chuck on staff, but we have a lot of other um, highly skilled technology experts who could help answer me. that. We're really not biased to either of those, so we'll give you true, you know, kind of. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if we didn't get to your question, we will follow up um, personally with you. Um, but we, it, it is time to bring this to a close. I want to thank everyone for attending this webinar. Nave, what you said about um, there's not a script, it's a process. That was really um, potent advice and a great way of looking at that. Um, so thank you all for spending a little bit of time with us today. I just want to remind everyone that the DCL Learning Series comprises webinars, um, a monthly newsletter, we have a blog. Um, you can access many other webinars related to content structure, to S1000D, to other XML standards, and more from the on-demand section of our website at dataconversionlaboratory.com. I do hope to see you at future webinars and hope everyone has a great day. Uh, this concludes today's broadcast. Thank you.